Disney Classics, original programs, National Geographic, Marvel TV shows and movies, Star Wars. Now these are just some of the choices you'll get on Disney Plus. And this is the podcast for Disney Plus fans. Join Scott Murray, Regina Davis, and Nathan Chick as they bring you breaking news, programming recaps, in-depth discussions, and insightful interviews that will take your Disney Plus fandom to new levels. Welcome to the Disney Plus Streamcast. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this episode of the Disney Plus Streamcast. I'm Scott Murray, and with me, as always, is Regina Davis. Hey, guys. So, it's already August, and that Mm. means D23 is right around the corner. And you know what I found out last week, Regina, was that if you get to go to D23, not only are you going to get some really good stuff related to Disney Plus and learn about all kinds of things they're doing and get to immerse yourself in some of the content, you're also going to be able to be some of the first people to subscribe to the streaming service. No way. Way. Dude, (laughs) no, that's such a good incentive. I love stuff like that. Yeah, so you're already set up, and all you got to do is wait for it to pop on on the day it launches, I guess. Kidding me. That is awesome. So speaking of D23, the way our show is currently scheduled, we wouldn't be back here to discuss it until two weeks later after it's over. (laughs) Ooh, can't have that. No. We have our show in the week leading into D23, and then two weeks later, we we would have to wait to uh, talk about it. So we're actually going to um, wait another week before we come back so that we're able to fully indulge in this. So our next episode will actually be on August 28th so that we can talk about what happened at the convention coming out of that weekend and we can talk about it with you. In the meantime, though, we do have a great show planned for you today. Yeah, so... One of the many programs you can expect to see on Disney Plus is a documentary series about the Disney Imagineers. And it's a show created by Leslie Iwerks, and she is an Oscar and Emmy-nominated director and producer. Her work includes the Pixar story in 2007 and Industrial Light and Magic, Creating the Impossible in 2010. If you've been to a Disney park, you've seen the amazing work of the Disney Imagineers firsthand. You've also heard their amazing work. In fact, today we're going to talk to an Imagineer who wrote content for Disney World. Yes, we'll talk to the former Disney Imagineer Brian Collins later on the show. But first, we have to talk some news. It's time for News with Nathan. Why, hello, sir, my lady. How are you both doing on this fine evening? Very good. Excellent, excellent. You know, it's been a bit quiet for news because everything, I think, is like building up to D23 mm-hmm. and people are mm-hmm. keeping bits and pieces under their hats collectively. But that's okay. We still mind a few data nuggets for the true believers listening at home. Um, we're going to start with something sad, though. Disney legend Russi Taylor passed away last yeah. week. Yeah, Russi Taylor, the voice of Minnie Mouse, beat out 200 people in audition for that role in 1986. Um, one of their first transmedia actors in that if you watch the TV shows, Mickey Mouse Works, House of Mouse, Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, even Mickey and Roadster Racers, if you watched the shorts, if you watched the movies, if you heard the voice in the theme park it was her she yeah. did it also did a couple of other voices that she was known for in the disney canon uh nurse mouse and rescues down under also huey yeah. dewey and louie and ducktales as well what as as, yeah yeah you know she had a quite a wide range she also did martin prince in the simpsons oh, and, and you know she's keeping it in the family absolutely her husband uh, was also the voice of Mickey Mouse. She met him while she was part of Disney. Her husband, Wayne Allwine, uh, they, he had done the voice of Mickey since 1977. They married in 91 and stayed together until he passed away, sadly, in 2009. So very much just as on the screen in real life, 
uh, Bob Iger left her a really lovely tribute on the uh, the Disney, uh, I think Twitter and Instagram as well. A really nice statement about her contribution to Disney, and I think all the fans who you know they 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 love their Mickey, they love their Minnie, kind of in mourning oh, right now. That's man, so too- sad, but what a legacy, man. 200 oh, people yeah. auditioning for Minnie Mouse. I wonder how many different variations of that voice there were. Oh, yeah. Man, that's weird to think about. <laughs> you know? And it makes you wonder as well, did they know what they were looking for or did she just have it? You know, did she? Just, what did she bring to the role that everyone else didn't? What made that that uh, those production people, that casting guy, what made his eyes just get bigger and say, you know, that's, that's my Minnie. Um, you know, we're, we'll move on and we'll keep it slightly maudlin because I can't hear this song without bursting into tears. I don't know why. I think I'm just genetically hard coded that way. Uh, Scott, your best friend Kermit the Frog mm-hmm. made a surprise appearance at the Newport Folk Festival the other day. Um, 40th anniversary of the Muppet movie. Fathom Events brought it back out I went. to commemorate. Yes, I th- thought you might. I, I had an inkling. <laughs> we all knew he would. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What was it like on the big screen, by the way? I've never oh. seen a movie on oh, the big well, screen. Is it, uh, is it everything you wanted? Or has well, it dated? See, I saw it on the big screen when it came out. <laughs> so right. I just had to rem- <laughs> date myself. Uh, I don't, and I vaguely remember that just because it was cool to go to the movie theater and see the Muppets and all the amazing things that they did. It's still a wonderful movie, and everything holds up. The humor holds up, and the story holds up, and you know the the magic of everything that Jim and Frank and everybody did is still awesome and amazing. Especially when you step back and you look at everything they did, and and like I said, remember that they were pulling this off in the seventies some of the things they had all the characters doing and it, it's just it really is great i mean the music still is really really good i c- kind of wish they would do this more often because i think people need to go and immerse themselves in really you know original classic films like that and then a chance to see all those classic movie stars from the time too was was pretty neat oh cool so yeah kermit with uh, Jim James from My Morning Jacket and Janet Weiss, formerly of Slater Kinney on drums. He did a surprise appearance playing, of course, what else? The Rainbow Connection. And I am told there was not a dry eye in the house. How so could there be? It's but, on I mean, YouTube. I still get a little wigged out. Whenever they, you know, bring, you know, Kermit into real life and sort of do that, they do it so well and so effectively that it still kind of jars me, but everyone really enjoyed it. Indeed, indeed. Moving on, next quick hit, I guess we'll talk about Marvel TV. Runaways and Cloak and Dagger have a crossover coming out later this year. All 10 episodes of Runaways are going to hit on December 13th. The big bad for this season, it's uh, Morgan Le Fay, played by Elizabeth Hurley. Whoa. So, yeah, yeah, uh, Morgan Le Fay having some pretty serious history with Doctor Doom and the Avengers and Spider-Woman, if I'm right, I don't know, I'm going back a bit now, say you're dating yourself, Scott, me too, apparently. (laughs) Um, But in any case, um, we don't see a lot of the the regular Marvel TV crossovers, uh, except for obviously the Netflix ones. So it's kind of cool that Cloak and Dagger are making an appearance in one of those episodes of Runaways. I'm a big fan. I came for the music because it has a killer soundtrack, but I stayed for the show. And those guys are pretty cool. Um, my kid got to meet Chase, the guy who plays Chase um, at Fan Expo a couple of years ago. And you know what? He was the nicest, nicest, nicest man. I had no idea. Everyone else was like, oh, it's that guy from uh, Wizards of Waverly Place. He plays a werewolf. had no idea. I just knew he was the guy with the big gloves who liked to punch people in Runaways. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Coming on Hulu, as I say, December 13th. You know, that's so exciting. And whenever Runaways initially came out, and I had known that a Cloak and Dagger show, you know, was going to be happening, I was like, well, I wonder if they're ever going to cross those two over. Because they were pretty interactive with each other in the comic books. But it was Mm. one of those things that I never thought was going to happen. And yet again, I've been proven wrong they're making it happen. Yeah, and I think the cool thing about Runaways, as well as Cloak and Dagger, um, certainly more so 
for Cloak and Dagger, given my age, being the wrong side of 40. Um, but, you know, when I was getting into comics back in the day, the ones I started with, obviously, your, your Justice Leagues, obviously, your Avengers, your Superman, your Batman, Spider Man, Captain America. You get all those, mm -hmm. but then it's really cool to see someone uh, like, say, Cloak and Dagger is one of those. It was like almost like Hawk and Dove on the DV, yeah. DC side. It was posited like a little younger. And so as I was growing up, that one made more sense to me. I love reading about Tyrone and Tandy. It, it was uh, apart from, I guess, the, the whole Marvel continuity, which is a little harder for us to get in the UK because of distribution and things like that. You end up missing issues. But some really interesting characters. And yeah, certainly, um, and you'll have to correct me here if I'm wrong, Regina. Is it, was it Brian K. Vaughan who did Runaways? Yes. Was it him? Yeah. Again, quality writer. Mm, that dude has is a that... god. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, it's something that my kids have been able to get into because those comics, again, have just captured, I want to say captured that teenage experience. I mean, they're super, they've got superpowers. Uh, my kids don't unless that superpower is like asking for cash and whining a bunch. But... Um, <laughs> you know it's it's got that voice and it speaks to that audience so capably and it's just enjoyable no matter who you are because it feels authentic so yeah excited for that one coming out definitely something else i'm excited for you know i like my toys you know i like my merch and i was thinking man what am i gonna spend the money that i should be spending on my house on uh in recent weeks <laughs> you know what i've got all this stuff to do around my house but you know i just i just want to squander that cash and want to fritter it away what better <laughs> way build a bear coming in clutch deadpool build a bear what yeah deadpool build a bear <laughs> 40 dollars for the the basic thing comes with his uh katanas and everything you know you're gonna have to chill out on the disfigurement under the mask they're not doing that but you know i mean Darn it. You could get busy with some hot glue and go wild, Regina. You know, you do you, girl. <laughs> um, but there's also a bunch of accessories you can get to go with it. So they have, like, cowboy Deadpool. They have ballerina Deadpool. They have Deadpool with a bunch of plush roses. My favorite <laughs> one, Deadpool with the pink fuzzy bunny slippers and the pink fuzzy robe. Costs you 60 bones, but, I mean, you need I that mean... in your life. You, you're in, right? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd like to see... Uh... You know, they could have done Deadpool with the baby legs. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, we could just modify that ourselves, too. I mean, they could just take the baby doll legs and just attach it to mm -hmm. the bear. <laughs> exactly. Keep it the cowboy hat, though. Because uh, mm -hmm. nothing says Deadpool like a teddy bear. Oh, well, he is kind of a teddy bear, though. I mean, before... He would definitely say he is. After yeah. He, right Depends before on who he you're cut your head to. off. Yeah, I mean, you know... <laughs> I feel like that's a character that, as he sort of crept a little bit into the zeitgeist and broke that fourth wall a bit more often. Um, you know, when he first came out in uh, New Mutants, then obviously, terrible, terrible man. But these days, I think we've come to appreciate the, there's a warm, fuzzy side of yeah. Deadpool. You know, by God, if Build a Bear aren't going for that side. Yeah, brilliant. Good job, boys. Love it. Geniuses. Uh, you know what? I'm so in. The other thing I saw this week. LA Times is reporting that the city of Anaheim has approved a whole bunch of building permits for projects such as a bathroom overhaul, a retail outlet, a microbrewery, a character meet and greet area, and improvements to behind-the-scenes buildings at the uh, Disney California Adventure Park, the bit that normally held the Bugs Life exhibit. Um, it's being ripped down. If you go there now, there's temporary walls up with Stark Industries written on the side. Nice. You get in a Marvel park. They can't call it a Marvel park because of licensing agreements. I think Universal have the rights to that. But it's going to have a Spider-Man oh ride. God. And a whole bunch of other superhero-themed stuff. It's going to incorporate the Guardians of the Galaxy Mission Breakout ride that's already there. And, uh, yeah, they're motoring on that thing. They're looking at getting some of that open for next year. That Stark Industries thing on the temporary walls is just genius. Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Woo. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just when you were saving up for that trip of a lifetime to go and right. hit up Galaxy's Edge, 
then you know what? You have to remortgage the house and do it all over again in a year <laughs> or two because, again, they just got you on the end of that leash. They're going to keep on reeling you in, you know, pulling you back, and you'll be there begging at the table for more scraps. I know I am. You know, Man. it's to say, to thine own self be true, right? Yeah. So hook, line, and sinker, they've got us. And I guess the other thing I'm going to finish on to do with the parks, unlike Galaxy's Edge, in Anaheim, the Florida location is gonna get to sell booze out and about in the park. What? Yeah, you can have all sorts of different cocktails and beers. Twelve fifty for a beer. I tell you, that's gotta be some really good beer for me to want to pay twelve fifty for it. But if this new movie turns out the way I think it's going to, I might just be happy to drink my sorrows away. Don't let me down, JJ. I don't want to spend twelve fifty on a whole bunch of beers. You this know, to again. Get... No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Because that's the other thing as well, right? They had um, a, a bunch of, I guess, between Lego and Hasbro, the toy people. There's a bunch of reveals for, like, the Sith Troopers and the Rocket Troopers and all the cool guys that are the Knights of Ren. All those dudes that are coming out for the next episode. I just remember being so terribly, terribly burned with the toys from the last movie and the one before. Like, oh, hey, that guy looks cool. You know, who's that? It's Praetorian Guard. Yeah, he looks real badass. Oh, dead. Dead in a second. Okay, cool. <laughs> well, don't forget, that's what they did to Captain Phasma, too. Yep. Right, Captain Phasma, you know, and it, it's taken, I guess, uh, that the comics for Captain Phasma have really kind of repositioned yeah. her as some, like, cruel and calculating, again, completely badass person. And maybe you believe the mythology a little bit more. You know, see how she earned that shiny armor of hers. And, you know, all the, I think all the Star Wars comics that have come out recently from Marvel ha- have generally had that reputation. Uh, I know I love Dr. Aphra. That was great. And the Vader stuff was amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I have for you this week. I love it when we get them heated right at the end. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I started this news thing and tried to be impartial to begin with. And it's like, you know, dude, you're playing with my my memories. It's you're messing with my nostalgia. You don't have to be incredibly just... impartial. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have theme music, Scott. I'm the news guy. I have the accent. I feel like it's it's beholden upon me yeah, to but bring. Even a lot to... of news this day isn't what you would call impartial. So, mm-hmm. you oh know. boy, <laughs> don't don't start, Scott. <laughs> Good lord. <laughs> FYI, <laughs> nothing that Nathan man. said today was hashtag fake news. all right well we'll do this again actually in three weeks because we're going to make that a very d23 heavy show so we look forward to finding out everything that happened between now and then and of course everything that happened at d23 so we look forward to having you back with us then that'll be an exciting show absolutely yeah see you then guys coming up we're talking to former disney imagineer brian collins about his work at disney world That's next on the Disney Plus Streamcast. Disney Plus launches in just three months. If you're subscribed to the Disney Plus Streamcast when it launches, you'll be able to watch the movies and shows and then join us for some recaps. We cannot wait to talk about everything with you guys very soon. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. So when was the last time you visited one of the Disney parks? Oh, man, I was probably an early teenager. Okay. It's been a long time. You need to go back. I know. (laughs) I've been to Disney World at... um... A few times, um, I went to Disneyland for the first time a few years ago because uh, I was actually at a conference out there or a convention. It might have been Star Wars Celebration, um, you know, because I always went to Disney World because you know there's nothing wrong with Disneyland. It's just smaller and a kind of a yeah. little more brief experience. I think when we went to Disney World one time, they said you could fit Disneyland in Disney World's parking lot. <laughs> So, Whoa. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, that puts it into context. <laughs> I look forward to all kinds of stuff when we get to go. We're fortunate enough to have some family out in Altamont Springs, and that's one of the reasons why we're able to go as often as we can sometimes. 
But I always like talking to people about what they like the most about the parks, which is kind of an unfair question because you really can't pick just one thing. Yeah. Um, usually, unless unless the one thing is everything, <laughs> some people may right. pick that. But I did ask that on our Disney poll this week. I said, which of these is your top reason mm. for going to the Disney parks? I had to think about how I could break it up into four options. So this is what I came up with. The escape, the rides, the food, or the merchandise. Ooh, that's a good one. Because, I mean, you know, like you said, some people, that they're going to feel like it's all of that. But that almost falls into the escape category if you can't pick out one of those other things. Yeah. So, well, because of that, I'm going to say that escape is the biggest one. Escape. I'm going to say it got, like, at least 40%. Oh, no, like 35%. The escape got 70%. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the rides got 20%, merchandise got 10%, food got 0%, but I bet if we Whoa. had more people involved, I mean, that's not a knock on the food. The food's good. I mean, obviously, it depends on where you go and what you really like, but, I mean, unless you're talking about, like, park food <laughs> or if you're talking about restaurant food, sometimes that yeah. can be the difference. But, you know, you think about things like the Dole Whip. I mean, that's something that people you know, have an obsession over. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that would count as the food. It's, it's tricky for me because I wouldn't be able to do that. Although I think I would pick the escape too, because yeah. I think that's the first thing when I know we're going to go, I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is once I step in there, actually I would go further than that driving down the freeway and you see, and you pass under that, you know, big sign, that arch that says Walt Disney world. Mm -hmm. That's when you know you basically left reality. Yeah, you're just transported to com like somewhere completely different, and it's all magical. Yeah, that's all it is for me. Do you remember when you went? A couple of the attractions, you know, that obviously were created by Disney Imagineers that you remember from back in that day. Um. Well, the Great Movie Ride is a big one that I remember, uh, just because. It just scared me to death. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I remember wanting to ride, even though it, it's, you know, such a low-key thing. In all the, you know, Disney advertisements I'd seen, you know, for its amusement parks were those dang teacups. Oh, yeah. And I had to do it. And it was just as magical as, you know, I thought it would be. I think for me, I mean, I remember going the very first time. Uh, my parents took my brother and I, uh, I think it was probably the late, maybe the mid eighties, uh, mid to late eighties. One of the really cool things I remember seeing in one of those early trips that we took as a family was this thing called cranium command. And hmm. this was one of those things where Disney figured out a way to make it kind of fun to learn about how something like the brain functions. Yeah. And the premise of this was, you know, uh, you you walked in and they showed you this little animated thing that showed that basically what's happening in the brain. There's these little people that go that drop into your head and they run your brain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, once you go into the auditorium, you watch this new recruit who is now controlling the brain of like a 13 year old boy. And in order to explain how you know all the different things the brain handles, they had celebrities in this pre taped uh, event. Uh, play the different parts of everything that was going to be involved. So, oh, wow. You had Left Brain, which is analytical. That was played by Charles Grodin. You had the Right Brain, which is creative, and that was John Lovitz. <laughs> you had the Stomach, which was George Wendt. You had the Heart, which was Hans and Franz. <laughs> you had Adrenaline, which was Bobcat Goldwaith. <laughs> <laughs> what? And it was really, really ingenious. And <laughs> it's not there anymore. In fact, someone showed on Twitter the other day uh, uh, a picture of how it's now just uh, a room full of boxes. And it just makes me so Aww. sad because that was like a must visit every time you went into that area. Of course, that whole area is different now. It was it used to be a full area about... You know, the brain, the body, and fitness, and it's just, you know, it's not that anymore. No, it's just storage. Um, That's so sad. 
obviously as a Star Wars fan, going to do Star Tours the first time was cool, and it's really amazing what they've done to that now. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the animatronics. That's the thing that I think is really fascinating about what the Imagineers have done when you go to, like, Hall of Presidents. Oh, yeah. And you're watching, you know, Abraham Lincoln. It's either the Hall of Presidents, you have it there, and then the American Experience in um, Epcot when you really think you're seeing Abraham Lincoln and Mark Twain and Ben Franklin and then all the presidents all talking and moving, and they look so lifelike. Right. They really hit you with that uncanny valley feeling. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So they do some absolutely amazing work, and they were always ahead of their time, and they're still innovating today. And, you know, there's a lot to see in Disney parks thanks to the creative work of those Disney Imagineers, but they're also involved in what you hear as well. Brian Collins worked as a writer for Magic Kingdom and Epcot Center. His early work included developing concepts for the Jungle Cruise and the Great Movie Ride, one of my favorites. Today, he's a sought-after speaker and consultant through his own business endeavors like the Brainstorm Institute, the Thematic Design Group, and the WDWithMe.com. With Disney Plus set to launch a new documentary series about Imagineers, we thought it would be great to get some insights a little early. So Brian is joining us today on the Disney Plus Streamcast. Hi, Brian. Welcome to the program. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Well, it's great having you here because uh, we haven't had a chance to talk to a, a Disney Imagineer before, and we're really excited about this series. And when I was reading over your history and your um, your background with Disney, one thing yeah. that I, I thought was really kind of interesting about it, because I just hadn't thought, I guess, this deep into it, was typically when you see a lot of the uh, smaller spotlights on the Imagineers, it's usually about, you know, all the visual stuff. I remember like not yeah. long ago they were showing how the Imagineers came up with the new animations for the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, um, right. and everything that went into that. However, you don't necessarily stop and think about the other aspects of it. Uh, and in your case, I thought it was fascinating that, you know, a big part of what you were doing was you had a lot of um, script writing and content, a lot of the things that you hear yep. when you go to these attractions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, my role was as what they call a show writer. So uh, when we talk about show writing in Imagineering, it's not necessarily writing shows per se. It's writing for the Disney show, which is the complete Disney experience. Mm -hmm. So uh, the guys that do like bad jokes for the Jungle Cruise, in my case, I did stuff for the Great Movie Ride. Um, But even stuff like signs that you find throughout the parks that are themed out. Um, One of the very first things I was asked to write was some themed graffiti for the New York Street backlot at the Ah. studios when that was uh, still active. Yes. Wow. What a cool project. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's just funny that you mentioned, you know, how most of the focus goes on to what you're seeing when really there's so many layers to the level of Mm -hmm. immersiveness Mm -hmm. that it delivers. So. Your work is unbelievable, and okay. I thank you for it. <laughs> well, thanks. It, it was a lot of fun. You know, it's something that we all realize that we're very lucky and blessed to be doing, and we take it very serious, as fun as it is. You know, one, one of the cool things is that when you work as an Imagineer, you're never really, like, pigeonholed into just one thing. So even though my primary work was as a writer, I also work with um, what they call, like, the show set designers, who do the theming for the attractions and make you feel like you're immersed in the areas. One of my um, larger projects was actually um, doing some work in the uh, great movie ride um, and kind of uh, working on not only kind of updating the scripting and freshening up some of the scripting in there, but also the staging uh, for the uh, cast members that played the different roles in there. Oh yeah. The gangster and the bandit. Yeah. So. See, that's crazy. And I feel like I have a bone to pick with you now. <laughs> because when Go I was ahead. You, you eight be or the nine, first one. <laughs> <laughs> when I was eight or nine, you know, who gave you the right to make it all that realistic? <laughs> because <laughs> I was eight or nine and I went on this ride with my dad and he was like, no, I'm sure it's going to be fine. And I was like, dad, I think this might be, I don't know. I was a very timid <laughs> child. 
And then, you know, I went on it. You know, there's some loveliness of, you know, singing in the rain. Then right. we get into some Indiana Jones. I'm seeing a body burst into flames and turn into a skeleton. <laughs> then we get to Alien. By the time this thing is over, I'm completely emotionally drained. I'm freaked out. <laughs> I well, that just means it was really sack. effective, Regina. It, it oh was immersive. God. That's right. <laughs> that so, is just uh, So I'll tell you kind of an interesting story. It, it actually, at one point, was going to be even a little bit more uh, dramatic. Um, when when the gangster, when, when the attraction was very first uh, conceptualized and, and when they first opened it, when the gangster actually, you know, hijacks the car that you're in, yeah. uh, there was a scene where he actually shot the tour guide. <laughs> and and I, I've got an old publicity still that shows, you know, the tour guide getting shot. And they actually had like a Velcro patch over their pocket that they could rip off. And there was like a little blood splat oh there. My God. <laughs> oh, my God. And uh, I, I guess it. You know, at some point they realize, well, maybe we shouldn't be shooting our cast members in front of like little kids or something. <laughs> yeah, like Regina. And, I would have yeah, had a heart attack. Right. So right. she may not be with us today if that had gone through. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, man. so, so, so that was kind of um, reimagined. Um, and, and actually, you know, I'll tell you one, one of the things that, like I said, that I worked on in there was the staging. And a big part of that was making sure that we were very deliberate in um, scripting where the cast members, for example, would point their guns Mm -hmm. uh, when they took a shot. So Mm -hmm. you never saw a cast member pointing the gun at another human being, for example, um, and things like that. So we wanted to make sure it was, you know, an entertaining um, show, but also a very safe show and and not a traumatic one, for sure. (laughs) So yeah, and yeah, on the Jungle Cruise ride, I know the thing that you you had worked on were were some of the uh, some of the radio drama elements yeah. that you hear as you walk through it. Um, yeah. So what was your creative process there? Was it? I mean, obviously, part of it is just kind of getting you ready for the experience, oh, kind of getting you gosh. in that mindset. But then at the same time, I assume people you kind of want people to pay attention to it a little bit while they're working their way to the ride. Yeah, you know. Um, so Albert Awal. Um, that whole thing came about because the Jungle Cruise was the first cue that Disney really kind of went in and really kind of enhanced and plussed um, to make it really immersive, you know, certainly for an outside attraction. Oh, yeah. You know, part, part of before we did the scripting for that, everything at Disney revolves around a story, a storyline yeah. and, and all of that. Um, and so, you know, that's the first thing is that I had to kind of understand what the intent was of the story in the queue. And basically, you know, as you're going through, you realize that, you know, it's set up as kind of like a jungle outpost and there's like little offices where, you know, you might see different, either jungle cruise skippers may Mm -hmm. have worked or, or, uh, you know, different explorers and stuff. And you'll see, you know, props that kind of set that story for you. Um, And then it was a matter of, well, writing Albert Awal and um, understanding the time frame that the whole Jungle Cruise experience takes place in. So if you listen to Albert Awal, it's really kind of like a 1930s, 1940s kind of a feel to it. Yeah. Once we had an understanding of, of what the story and the intent was, um, for the queue area, for the entire queue area. Um, then it was really just a matter of, you know, I worked with my, my boss, actually. He's a very, very talented writer in his own right. Um, that's kind of how he started with Imagineering and before he moved up to be the creative director out there. And uh, so he and, I, and he and I, you know, we love a good pun. Um, and, and a lot of what you hear in there is just, you know, just really bad puns. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it. It, it was just a lot of fun. Just, you know, I remember sitting down and we would sit down and collaborate and kind of just, you know, work through these kind of jokes and stuff. So, so yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It seems like that process has evolved a little more over time to be even more visual, 
because there's so much of yeah. the of the pre show or pre ride things that you know are doing those sort of things. You still see things like you described where. As right. you're working your way through, you see desks or whatever might fit the theme. But there are right. a lot of elements now where uh, you're watching stuff on screens, it seems like, versus kind of having to have an imagination and listen to something in audio. It's, you know, it's interesting. Um, certainly technology is really, you know, continues to change and impact how Imagineers deliver the story that, that they want to tell. You know, back in the day, we we didn't have you know, AR and VR and the sophisticated projections and, and stuff that they have to work with now. But um, all of that is, to be honest, just kind of like window dressing. And I, I think, you know, there's still a lot of nice examples where the technology is integrated, but it's not, it, it doesn't overpower, mm-hmm. it, if you will. Because mm-hmm. I, I think, you know, again, at the end of the day, it comes down to, to just being able to tell a really good story. Um, you see a lot more of the technology impacting inside the attractions is, um, you know, you're going through in terms of like said, maybe projection mapping or, or things of that nature, but, but it still comes down to just, you know, being able to tell a really good story. Yeah. You know, and Regina, what I was thinking about too, you know, as we've talked about, you know, like the star Wars films over the years. Yeah. You know, I think there's a parallel there in what Brian's talking about in that, you know, there there are people, you know, they've obviously gotten to the point now where they can create a lot with CGI, but it's yeah. possible yeah. for that CGI to be so overpowering that it's just so clear that it's CGI that it almost takes you out of it. Yeah, it's completely whereas, invasive. <laughs> yeah, whereas there's still some value to what I guess they now refer to as practical effect. You know, it's it's interesting that you mentioned that because I was literally... This is like the kind of research and homework I do now, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Even though I'm not an Imagineer anymore, I still have a very strong connection to the themed attraction um, industry. And I actually teach courses in um, either product development for theme parks is one of the courses or entertainment technology and innovation at UCF, Mm -hmm. um, University of Central Florida here. So, and, and, and I also do other consulting work, so I have to stay on top of it. And I was actually this evening, uh, doing some, uh, homework into the new galaxy's edge, Mm. right. Which is going to be just spectacular. And there's one shop in there that is basically designed to be a shop that's filled with all kinds of collectible items from throughout the galaxy yeah and a couple of things they have in there for example are like one of like the um snow monsters from hoth um Mm -hmm. you know he's kind of like stuffed in there um they have and, and it's all like wonderful practical props and i was actually talking to the guy tonight um who happens to be a uh you know a a friend of mine um but the guy who actually designed and sculpted, you know, three of the creatures in there. And um, I thought it was just so cool how, you know, they they have all this technology and stuff at their disposal, but they went to so much trouble to recreate so many of these props and and imagery and stuff that you see throughout um, Galaxy's Edge. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I want to say I, I saw that, or at least someone take a photo in one of those places, and I think what they were highlighting was, like, one of the props was the little flashlight that Yoda plays right. with on, on Dagobah. You can literally buy one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And oh, and they, they actually have some little Easter eggs in there, too. There's actually, if you look closely, you might see maybe, like, the Ark of the Covenant from Raiders of the Lost Ark kind of tucked away, so... Oh my yeah. gosh, that's so cool. <laughs> I just think that what you guys do is so impressive and so important because people really do get a massive escape at these parks. It's just like, yeah. you know, going to a completely different place. And the reason why it works is because of people like you, people who care so much about the project and about the outcome and the effect that it's going to have on people that that's why it's lasted so long and will continue to grow forever. Well, you know, one thing I will tell you is that, you know, we're all fans of Disney too. And, and like I said, we take the, um, the work very, very seriously. 
you know, I, I was really lucky when I was working at WDI that a lot of the original Imagineers were still around. And every once in a while, some of them would show up in Florida and they would talk to us, guys like Raleigh Crump or John mm-hmm. Hench or, you know, I met Mark Davis and had a chance to talk to him. And um, they were always just so gracious in kind of passing down their information and their knowledge and, and all of that. And I think that kind of continues today. You know, I mean, I think Imagineers at heart, I, I keep, you know, using this term storytellers, but I think at heart, that's what we all are. And I think we like to pass the stories down to each other as yeah. well. And, that's so beautiful. Yeah. The other thing that um, I thought was really kind of interesting is that I know that you give tours of Disney World and you yes. uh, feature a lot of really good insights and stories that really add to someone's experience of the park when they go on those with you. <laughs> and um, one of the things that I saw that you've said that when you do those, one of the best things that happens in those tours is when you show people something that they've never noticed. And sometimes those are people who think they've seen everything because they've been so many times, yet there were yeah. still things they hadn't noticed. Very true. Um, that happens a lot and it surprises the heck out of me to be honest. <laughs> um, sometimes, you know, you get so, um, in, in my case, I think, you know, I'm, I'm saying something that to me is like really obvious or, you know, I've seen a million times and then I'll point it out to someone else and they'll be like, gee, I never saw that. Or, <laughs> I never knew that. Or, I mean, there's so many Disney fans out there and there's so much information out there. So, you know, when I can walk someone through the parks and show it to them from a completely different point of view, that's really fun. Oh. So when, when you were working there, um, it sounds like there's there's elements where you've got to kind of hone what you're supposed to do, but there's also a lot of collaboration. So yeah, um, is the what's really kind of involved in the Imagineer creative process? Is it a typical week or month just based on the attractions <laughs> that are set to get launched a certain day, or <laughs> and you're just kind of in and out um, as needed? And... and there's nothing typical. Uh, <laughs> you know, I will tell you, the, the work was just really kind of, amazingly fun and you're working with a bunch of big kids a lot of times i mean i remember one time i was like sitting at my desk and one of the art directors came by and he's like brian brian come outside and and he's like going around the office he's getting like all all the you know all all of us together it's like everyone come outside and we go outside and all of a sudden we walk outside and it's like you know 98 degrees out to (laughs) go forward to summer but it's snowing and this guy had gone like a sample, like a, a snow machine, which now they're very common. The snow machines that blow out kind of like the soap bubbles, but yeah. it looks like real snow. Yeah. But he got like one of the first prototypes of those. So we walked out and we're like, oh, like, you know, getting snowed on. <laughs> and uh, it was it, it was just very, very bizarre. And that kind of stuff happened all the time. <laughs> wow. um, but. But but there was, yeah, absolutely a lot of uh, collaboration between us. And especially if in Florida where, you know, where I was based, um, we had a smaller team. So, I mean, it was wonderful because, you, you know, you're working with just incredibly talented people and, and everyone respected everyone else. And, um, you know, the stuff we got to uh, to do together was was really fun. And then to be able to go back and, you know, kind of watch the guests enjoy it. That's yeah, like I bet that's the, the best thing. Part. Yeah. Yes. Except for my kids. They didn't believe half the time I would say, you know, hey, I did that. You know, I worked on that. And they'd be like, no, you didn't. <laughs> Whatever, Dad. And I'd be like, right. <laughs> right. Then I'd show them like a script or, you know, some artwork or whatever. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, you know, knowing the knowing the process the way you do, I bet it's also kind of a cool experience too when you go to the park as you know just for fun, and perhaps yeah. they've they've launched something or done something yeah. new, and you're probably thinking about you know how they did this or that or the other. Is there something that's come out in the last few years that you were just really blown away by as far as the work that the Imagineer team put into it? Um, you know. That's a really interesting question. And what I will tell you is that there is stuff that was done years before I ever got there um, that blows me away. Oh, sure. You know, when, when I look at the classic attractions like Pirates of the Caribbean or the mm-hmm. Haunted Mansion, you know, the amount of detail and design, you know, that 
went into those. And then, you know, as I became an Imagineer and I started to learn the history of those attractions and I got to talk to Mark or, you know, some of the other guys that actually worked on them. And, and you start to learn how much went into those. Um, it really, you know, to this day, just still kind of blows me away. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of new stuff, I will say I'm, I'm absolutely very anxious to get out to Galaxy's Edge. I haven't been out there yet. Yeah. But I know a lot of people that have worked on that project. You know, when Soren first came out, you know, the, the concept of the flying theater, uh, that was the first one that was that was created and to me that's a, a very cool mind-blowing kind of a very much so yeah kind of an attraction yeah um i there's a lot props to the guys who are still doing it and, and doing a great job yeah i mean that's one of the reasons why despite how long they've been around people it never gets old going and watching that stuff again mm-hmm. um never. you know you walk out there especially something like haunted mansion is still liable to have a really long line and as many times as you've seen that you do find yourself not only kind of enjoying it but just being amazed at what they put together i mean right out of the gate you think about walking into that room the door closes and then it looks like the room is stretching (laughs) yeah (laughs) as you're as you're going down and then the woman hanging from the ceiling up at the top and the lights go out i mean it's I remember the first time I saw that as a kid. That traumatized me a little bit. <laughs> it's all just too real. But yeah. with the level of detail that all these things have, I mean, you'd almost have to go and see it a third and fourth and fifth time before yeah. you're really even able to notice, you know, half of what's even going on. Yeah, yeah. And and that is what's fun about walking people through the parks is being able to kind of slow them down and kind of focus them on certain parts of the detail. Yeah. Um, that they normally wouldn't notice, and, and that's when they really kind of get to see it from from a very different kind of perspective, and I think appreciate it that much more. So you mentioned, um, you know, some of the things you're doing now. Um, I yeah. know that uh, you've you've launched a few business ventures of your own. So what what <laughs> kind of work are you doing now, and um, what are you involved in? Well, you know, the the tours and, and dinners with the park are, are part of it, but a lot of it's just kind of like leveraging my imaginary background in different ways. Um, yeah. I've actually been doing quite a bit um, with education. Um, I, I actually have a background in education myself. Mm-hmm. Um, later in my career, after I moved on from Disney, um, at one point I worked as an innovation specialist for the Florida Virtual School, which is the state of Florida's online virtual school. And my job was to go out and find like new and emerging technologies and figure out how to cross-pollinate those into education. Um, So it was a really fascinating job. And I was working with a lot of really cool like R&D entities out there. So um, like uh, even like military groups that were working in simulation or universities or uh, General Motors or Apple, you know, just, just all kinds of different companies. It, was, it cool. was very, very cool. Your um, life is so exciting. <laughs> nah, nah. Never a dull moment. <laughs> you know, when I get home, the wife is still like, take out the garbage, all right? <laughs> Back to reality. <laughs> Back to reality. Just like when you go to the park and come home. <laughs> so so anyway, so uh, between that and then between my teaching experience, because I've taught at several different colleges and universities, um, education is something that's very near and dear to my heart, yeah. um, especially STEM education. And um, I've, I've gone to several conferences and, and been asked to speak at, at different schools about how to bring Imagineering techniques into the classroom, mm. how to deliver that Disney customer service, you know, things of that nature. Um, I also do some corporate stuff. So I had a pharmaceutical company, for example, come here um, several months ago, and they brought a small innovation team of about 20 people. And for one full day, I put together a um, kind of like a scavenger hunt in Epcot. Oh, that's Where they had to go out. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, But everything that I had them looking for or doing during the scavenger hunt had a tie-in back to projects that they were working on within their pharmaceutical ah, industry. Okay, And then we spent the second day in a conference room kind of debriefing everything and connecting the dots and 
getting them to kind of think outside the box a little bit more. Um, a lot of design thinking kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm actually uh, going to be on a cruise in about a month, a Disney cruise of all things. Ah, uh, I've yet to with, do one of those. <laughs> yeah. I'll be talking to, I think it's like a hundred or maybe several hundred Disney travel agents and telling them a little bit about what I do and how to deliver, you know, that wonderful Disney customer service and that kind of thing. So, as we wrap up here, real quick, I, with with uh, your experience and also your yeah. your passion for education, I was wondering if someone's listening to this or they watch the Disney Plus series and they see that and they go, "Yeah, that's it. That's what I want to <laughs> do." Is it is it kind of challenging if someone wants to um, perhaps pursue a career as a Disney Imagineer? You know, it took me a lot of whining and, and <laughs> a lot of a lot of money more than anything. <laughs> you know, just having to pay off the right people. Um, that's probably one of the most common questions I get asked is how do you become an Imagineer? And, you know, I got to tell you, there's no one way to do it. There's a lot of different ways that people kind of fall into the Imagineering role. None of them are easy. (laughs) Yeah, I'm sure. Um, What I would say is if you're still in college, um, look into the Disney college program Mm -hmm. to kind of get your foot in the door and learn, um, the Disney culture. I actually, my very first job at Disney was actually working at the front desk of the Contemporary Resort. Okay. Um, checking guests in. And it was a great job to start because that's where I learned everything about Disney customer service and the yep. culture of the company and synergy and, and you know, all of that stuff. Um, and then through networking within the company, I eventually made my, my way into Imagineering. If you're in college, they also, every year, WDI has a competition where they put the um, call out. I, I can't remember exactly what, what time of the year it comes out. I think it's in the first part of the school year. And they give you like a project to do, and then you pull together a team of about five to seven people, and you design a new attraction or, or mm. whatever it is. Um, the focus of the contest is, and I believe the winning team gets invited out to Glendale uh, to uh, WDI's headquarters out there. And I'm pretty sure most of them, if not all of the team members on the winning teams and probably some of the other teams are offered internships at WDI. So so that's a great thing to do too. Beyond that, a lot of it is making sure that you're just very good at your craft. Yeah. And not only are you good at it, but you bring something a little bit unique and different to it as well. Um, I, I think that's really what they look for. In my case as a writer, you know, um, my boss liked me because not only could I write the, the corny puns and, and jokes and stuff for, for some of the scripts and attractions, but I could also write the operational spiels. I could write mm. poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, I could write graffiti. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they want you to be very well schooled in whatever your particular craft is, Makes whether sense. you're an engineer or an uh, artist or a writer. Well, we uh, appreciate uh, you coming on and, and, and sharing all this with us and, uh, and the insights that you have in the park. And it, it's been really fascinating to get uh, that look from the inside for those of us who haven't really had a chance to really know what some of that process is like. And I know that, like you said, that's a big part of what you're still doing. So we'll have links yeah. uh, on the show notes to your site where people can find out more about you and what you're doing and maybe Thank participate you. in one of those tours. And um, it's been a great conversation, and we've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun for me, too. Thank you. I, I uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Don't forget, our next show is in three weeks, so we can discuss D23 right after it happens. And don't forget, along with subscribing to this show, you can also stream or download episodes at DisneyPlusStreamCast.com. We're also on Twitter at Disney Plus Cast. Thanks for joining us. Bye, everybody. The entertainment, adventure, and magic on Disney Plus never stops. So join us for the next episode of the Disney Plus Streamcast. You can subscribe to the show on podcast providers like iTunes, Stitcher, and Spotify. Search, stream, or download any episode on our website. While you're there, get news updates, watch videos, follow us on social media, and check out the Streamcast Spotlight. Just go to DisneyPlusStreamCast.com. Thank you for listening.